Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we have a great grandchild now. I, I'm not old enough for that. I don't think so. I'm really not. I'm 80, but uh, at any rate, uh, we, we do have a large extended family all in the Vancouver, BC. That's not the Vancouver that's in the States, in Canada, a very large extended family. We do get together and it's a lot of fun. I'm very pleased to be with you. It's a great honor and a gift uh, to have this time with you. The subject is uh, really about spirituality and work and why the workplace is itself and is it. Why is it the primary location for spiritual growth? I, wouldn't it be church services or retreats at an abbey or, you know, your own personal quiet time? All those things are really, really good. But is it really true that the workplace is the primary location for spiritual formation. I like to ask this question. Would it be a good thing for you, spiritually, I'm going to add that word, if you had so much money that you never had to work again? I think it'd be terrible. It'd be terrible. So, we're going to be exploring this whole connection uh, that Eugene Peterson who, as you probably know, the translator of the message and a pastor to pastors and spent all his life in pastoral work till he came to Regent College where I have been teaching. But here he says, I'm prepared to contend that the primary location for spiritual formation, remember it's a pastor speaking, is the workplace. The problem is that we look at spirituality as something to compensate for the drain that we have in the workplace. If we're in business, we're in a profession, we're in a trade, whatever it may be. And this uh, Canadian business consultant, he's Roman Catholic, uh, John Dalla Costa says, if we, unless we encounter, uh, he used the word transcendence for God, with transcendence, unless that infiltrates work, transforms its aims, outcome, and possibilities, we're not really integrating God's presence, but more compensating for its disintegration. Now, my definition of spirituality comes from a South American Christian. He says, all spirituality springs from this fundamental fact of a God who loved us first. If Christian spirituality is, before all else, an initiative by and a gift from God who loved us and seeks us. Spirituality then is our recognition and response with all that entails to this love of God that desires to humanize and sanctify us. This path of spirituality is a process, and if you're American, it's a process. <laughs> Concrete, but never finished, by which we identify ourselves with God's plan for creation. And because this plan is essentially the kingdom of God and its justice or holiness, spirituality is identification with the will of God in bringing this kingdom to us and others. I can't think of a better definition of spirituality. God's initiative, seeking, finding it. It's not our taking steps to get to God. It's our responsiveness, recognition of it, our attending to God, and so on. This is from Segundo Galilea. Why is the marketplace, the workplace, the primary location? First, God's there. God is there. He's everywhere, but he, he's there right with you. You know, the beautiful thing uh, when I first became a Christian and at 18 years of age, somebody gave me Brother Lawrence's The Practice of the Presence of God. That was my very first Christian book that I read when I became a Christian besides the Bible. And uh, I discovered God's right there all the time we can talk to. Doing work that reflects and embodies the creative work of God. Art was helping with, uh, with that in his earlier presentation. The fact that we're working at all you know, I have many years disease, which means episodes of vertigo. And when I get up in the morning and everything is straight and level and stable, I just say, thanks God. You know, 
but the fact that we're working. And then in our co-workers who are image bearers of God, yes, some of them are just tough people to get along with, but they're image bearers of God, even if it's a bit twisted and a, a bit disguised. And then uh, there are no ordinary people, as C.S. Lewis put it, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your sentence, senses. And then uh, in our relationships with coworkers, uh, it's as been mentioned, I've been a pastor, I've been a, a carpenter, I actually apprenticed as a carpenter at 40 years of age. Uh, then I bought into the business. We were doing custom renovation in Vancouver on the west side. Uh, and then uh, we were building some new houses as well. I built two houses on the street in which I live. But I can tell you that I've had some real big struggles in, with co-workers. But that was an arena of growth. I grew more from those struggles, actually, than from my quiet times. And God is sustaining the factory, the office, the enterprise, and then sometimes we have charismatic events. Uh, we were building a new house, and uh, you, you work alongside sub-trades when you're a carpenter. And the drywall taper, this is the guy that puts up the gyp rock and then puts what we call mud, which is uh, it's like plaster, uh, and tapes the mud, the mud gets taped to the joints, and then these guys can do it so well. I could do it, but I can't do it as well as they do. They smooth it out so that when you look at a wall, you say, oh, I can't see any joints. It's just as smooth and straight and so on. After six weeks, this guy turned to me and he said, Paul, what happens when we die? Now listen, no pastor would have ever got that question. He would never have gone to a church. And yet he asked me. And so I had an opportunity over coffee break. I appreciate the remark. Um, over coffee break and lunch and afterwards, yes, charismatic events. You, some of you probably know the story of Abraham and Abimelech. Um, Abraham had a beautiful wife. Some of us in the room are married men, and there's some married women here too, I think. But uh, if you're a married man, don't be a husband like Abraham. Just don't do it. Don't even think about it. Because <laughs> he had a beautiful wife, and he goes, I have a beautiful wife. And he, he goes to his wife and he says, you know, if you really love me, oh, that's so manipulative. If you really love me, wherever we go, don't tell people you're my wife. Why? Well, everybody will want her and they'll kill me so they can marry this lovely widow. No, no, don't tell them you're my wife. Tell them you're my sister. And there's kind of a half truth in that. And so they go down to Abimelech's place, and Abimelech looks at Sarah and says, wow, she's the most from coast to coast. That's exactly what I said. My best boyfriend was dating my now wife, Gail, and I met her at a party. I was setting up the sound system like these guys at the back. I wasn't at the party. I was just doing stuff. And I met Gail. I thought, wow, she is the most from coast to coast. And I knew that she didn't dance. I love to dance, but she didn't. She was a Baptist. <laughs> and so uh, the only thing left in the student year was a faculty music concert. So on the way to breakfast, my buddy says, I'm going to invite Gail to the faculty music concert. And I said, I've got to get there first. And I did. I cut all my lectures, and I eventually got her be just before he phoned. Well, what happened is Abimelech says she's the most from coast to coast and brings her into his harem. Now, the night before he sleeps with her, you have to imagine Abraham's outside the harem and he's saying, oh, goodness, what have I got myself into? And she's inside the harem thinking, oh, man, my husband got me into this, you know. Uh, but God shows up in a dream to King Abimelech and he says, you're a dead man. This woman is not his, his sister, but his wife. And so this pagan king confronts the believer. Ever happened to you? It's happened to me. 
and says, why did you deceive me? And Abraham says, I thought there was no fear of God in this place. Oh, it's exactly what people think about corporations, about workplaces, about schools, universities, political arenas. No fear of God there, but listen, God's there. And God is at work, at work. God is actually at work, at work. God is a creator inventing new things. Wow. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things, Ecclesiastes. God keeps everything running. You couldn't breathe another breath if he didn't sustain the universe. He sustains patterns of time. Job 38, 39. I think my favorite book in the Older Testament is Job. I love it. And when God finally speaks to Job, he says, look, I'm, I'm looking after time, and I'm looking after weather and climate. I think he's doing a better job, actually, in California than in British Columbia. And then uh, he's sustaining the universe and life systems. So God is sustaining everything. And in the New Testament, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, this incredible insight that Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together, sustaining. And God is a redeemer, fixing and transforming and mending, and uh, he rescues and redeems the lost, and he saves the whole person. He mends broken hearts. We had a store near where I live in Vancouver where this guy was repairing electric and electronic instruments, and he had a logo over the door which said, we mend everything except broken hearts. And I thought, if the guy had been a believer, maybe he would have said, we'll do our best with broken hearts too. And God liberates people from bondage, brings justice, and brings about Sabbath rest. And Paul Marshall is a Canadian theologian. He says, the scope of redemption in Christ, wow, is the same as the scope of creation. Wow. And God's a consummator. He's bringing the whole thing to a wonderful conclusion. It's not going to end with a fizzle or a bang, but with the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ, the renewal of everything, and thanks for kainos, the renewal of everything. Uh, there's going to be personally the resurrection of the body. Now, listen to me. I'm not going to be a saved soul in heaven. I'm going to be a fully resurrected person with hair <laughs> in the new heaven and the new earth. You know, a lot of people think this baby died. Will it be a baby in heaven? Uh, this really old person died. Are they going to be really old in heaven? And uh, interestingly, um, one of the great fathers of the church, Augustine, said, Jesus died in the prime of his life, and possibly we in our resurrected life will be in our prime. Personally, I think I'm in my prime right now. <laughs> but uh, functionally, the perfection of human work. Uh, I do love working with my hands, and I still... Uh, and photography, yeah, it's the two things I do kind of mentally and manually. Uh, but we're going to work in the new heaven and new earth, not just going to play the same worship song and sing it 6,432 times, but we're actually going to be working, and that's going to be fun and worship. Socially, the city of God, culturally, everything. Most people will be Americans, but not everybody. There'll be a few Canadians off in the corner and so on. And ecclesiastically, the redeemed church, the consummated bride of Christ, and finally the renewal of everything in creation. You think this world's beautiful. It's going to be so renewed and so beautiful. So, I think it's really important to know that people in business and art and music, information technology, entrepreneurship, they're entering into God's ongoing creative work. When people tell me, I'm going to leave my job and go into the Lord's work, I say, what 
were you doing before? Now it's okay if God so leads you from one kind of Lord's work to go into another kind of Lord's work. That's okay. But don't say you're leaving secular work to go into the Lord's work because that's the Lord's work. And then those who are in homemaking and doing service roles. My wife has had three back surgeries and I've had to take over everything in the house. And I learned some really important things. I learned that when you make a meal, it gets eaten. And about four hours later, you have to make another one of those flipping things, you know? <laughs> And when the floor gets dirty, you sweep it, and then it gets dirty again. Homemaking. Creating an environment in which people can thrive. And organizational work, systems, and politics. All of these providing an infrastructure whereby people can flourish. And folks in medicine and law and counseling and pastoring and technicians are entering into God's transforming and redeeming work. People in journalism and the media, you say, well... You know, they don't do it perfectly. No, they don't. But, you know, journalists and media people are, are pointing to where things are going. What is the meaning of things? And that's a consummating work. And pastors and parents and educators. So when somebody says to me, I'm going full time, I say, there's no part-time option for followers of Jesus. No part-time option. There's no part-time option for followers of Jesus. Now, we are there, not just God, but we are there. Our whole selves, warts and all, are in the workplace, okay? Henry Ford once said, why is it that I always get the whole person when all I want is just a pair of hands? <laughs> the fact is, as the title of my book, Taking Your Soul to Work, suggests, that you can't really not take your soul to work. That is, you cannot go as a partial person to work. So, <clears throat> I, as a Sunday school dropout at 11 years of age, and my Sunday school teacher had a flannel graph, and there's nobody here old enough to know what a flannel graph is. It predates uh, predates the data projector, the overhead projector. You remember what those were like? And it was a board with uh, flannel cloth and the uh, pictures you had had a cloth backing. I think you've seen one of these things. And you can kind of stick it on. So she had this flannel graph and she put a figure up and she said, that's you. And then she put a big red heart right here and she said, you got a heart. I thought, that's nice, I got a heart. Then she took something the shape of a kidney, and it was gray, and she put it right there, and she said, and you've also got a soul. I thought, wow, I've got a soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. You know? But the soul, biblically, the soul is not an organ implanted in your body. It's you in your longingness and hunger for God and for life. So the workplace, you're there, and issues arise that are incredible opportunities for spiritual growth. Growth. Why am I so sensitive to criticism? Some of these are my questions. I don't have thin skin, I have no skin. The nerves are right on the surface. Uh, why do I fill up the gaps in my date book? Why do I find it hard to give up places or ministries? Why am I so competitive? Why is it so important for me to succeed? Why am I unable to let go of the pain of others? Why am I afraid to be alone, always seem to need people? And why am I so discontent? My wife knows me very well. She said, you're discontent. And she gave me a wonderful book on how to be content. <laughs> so. Work reveals our Achilles heel, that is our point of weakness, our point of vulnerability, and it's usually one of these three, a need to be needed, a need to be approved, or a need to be in control. For me, it's the need to be approved. I grew up in a home, my mom and dad were lovely Christians, they were really good parents. They're part of that generation, though, that thought if you affirm your children, they'll become proud. 
Well, if you don't affirm them, they'll push, push, push. And that's exactly what I did. I pushed academically, not athletically. Um, I'm, I do love skiing, and I canoe twice a year up in the north of British Columbia. But in terms of competitive sports, I'm hopeless. I stood in the middle of the field in high school with all my football uniform and pads on, and I was kicked off the team because I was standing there meditating on the meaning of the game. <laughs> so it's not the need to be needed for me, it's the need to be approved, and perhaps for you. I became the academic dean at Regent College. Uh, Regent College is where I retired from 10 years ago. As was mentioned, I'm Professor Emeritus now. Emeritus means has been, once was, now obsolete. <laughs> but I've been teaching full-time for 10 years, but not getting a full-time salary. And uh, I retired a second time this September and a year and a half ago, we started the Institute for Marketplace Transformation. I went to my medical doctor. I said, look, I'm 79. I'm, am I crazy at this age? He said, keep engaged. I went to my accountability group, said the same thing. They said, keep engaged. I think it's really important. But when I became the academic dean at Regent, my president, Dr. Walter Wright, who comes from California, said to me, four things. He said, first of all, I guarantee your success. If you fail, it's because I failed as your supervisor. Wow, what, how empowering that is. Secondly, he said, in the annual review, there will be nothing negative. I will stay up late the night before, write a long letter of affirmation, and give it to you the next morning. I'm reading this letter, the tears are coming up. This can't be me, you know. And then thirdly, he said, but, <laughs> it's always a but, but we will have breakfast every Thursday morning and we'll talk about everything. And when things are not going right, we're going to deal with it right then. And then fourthly, he said, in this job, you're going to have to deal with yourself. He said, you love to teach. You get a great response from people. But he said, you're not going to get it in this job. You're just not going to get it. He said, when certain faculty come into your office with a big complaint, the hairs on the back of your head will stand up straight. It's the only place I have hairs anyway. <laughs> so, uh, and he said, you're going to have to deal with yourself, and I will help you, which he did, which is why I devoted the book, uh, Doing God's Business, to my boss, Dr. Walter Wright. Our workplace struggles can be a prayer and heart longing for the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, we have struggles. Scientific American Mind magazine actually did, fairly recently, The Seven Deadly Sins. They had an interesting subtitle. They said, Turn Temptations into a Source of Strength. Very interesting. You know, the Bible says something very similar. You know, just praise God if you've got problems. Your struggles will become a means of growth and growth spiritually. Pride and power, these are the seven so-called deadly sins which are roughly parallel with the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5 in Paul's letter, Pride and Power. Uh, they had a number of illustrations of this. And then greed itself, and the price of greed. Um, I'm glad it's American dollars and not Canadian. And then uh, covetousness, uh, which is acquisitiveness, being defined by your house and your car, your job, your cottage, your whatever it is. Finding joy in the acquiring of things and seeing people as consumers. And lust. treating persons as bodies or objects and using people as instruments for personal gratification and not treating people as image-bearing creatures. Arousal is not the same as lust. We're all aroused by the other sex, but 
Lust is where, it's Martin Luther said, you know, he said, it's one thing for a bird to land on your head. You can hardly stop it from happening. But it's another thing to let it build a nest there. And arousal becomes lust when you fantasize a sexual caress with someone who is not your covenant partner. And then uh, envy, comparing yourself constantly with other people, your performance with other people, your appearance with other people, or the gifts. You know, uh, there's a wonderful old document from the 18th century, William Perkins, the treatise on callings, in which he, he really deals with the spirituality of calling. And he says, you know, he said it's wrong for us to be comparing our calling with somebody else's calling as though they have a better calling and wishing we were in their place. And he pulls in all kinds of scriptural references for it. And gluttony, which is living to eat rather than eating to live and living to work rather than working to live, although I appreciate the correction of that. Workaholism. I think I'm a recovering workaholic, okay? Uh, I, am I 100% healed? No, not yet. But I'm a recovering workaholic. And where does that come from? I'm so thankful. One of the elders in our church came to me one day and he said, Paul, I don't know why you're such a driven person, but I think it would be a good thing if you found out why. That set me on a journey. I'm so thankful for that guy. It set me on a journey of why am I push, push, push. I'm driven. And... Um, I, through inner healing and prayer and ministry and so on, uh, I've, am I healed completely? No, I'm not, but I'm on the way. Okay. Uh, I've, I've worked in academia for almost too long. I have my own business now. I'm self-employed. But one of the things I did when I became dean is I went to all my faculty one by one and I said, is it possible to be an academic without being a workaholic? And uh, all said, no, it's not possible, except for one. He said, I'm trying not to be. <laughs> and you know, we're in toxic workplaces these days that expect that kind of investment of your person. We can be gluttonous not just about food, but about work and sloth. You know, the Puritans in the 17th and 18th century were brilliant on so many things, but one of them is sloth. This is Baxter's. Sloth signifies chiefly the indisposition of mind and body, and idleness signifies the actual neglect or omission of our duties. Sloth is an awareness, an aversion to labor through a carnal love of ease or indulgence to the flesh, and it's easily identified when the very thought of labor is troublesome, when ease seems sweet, when the easy part of some duty is called out, and when you work with a constant weariness of mind, and when you consistently offer excuses or delays, and when little impediments stop you. A siren just went by. And love and wrath, the line between, the thin line between emotional manipulation. I'm thinking of a friend, you know, who used to, his upper lip used to quiver like this when he was a boat. He was like a, a cauldron of boiling water on the edge of the stove ready to dump. And you, you just knew. And his dear wife, you know, knew that sign and she always submitted. She didn't submit, she complied at that point. And I'm sorry to say that marriage didn't actually survive. Lack of self-control and creating submission and compliance through fear. Evelyn Underhill, who is a 20th century Christian mystic, said, fruit of the Spirit are ways of thinking, speaking, and acting which are brought forth in us gradually but inevitably by the pressure of divine love in our souls. One of the amazing things that happened to us as we were writing the book, Taking Your Soul and Work, it's co-authored by Alvin Ung, who is a Malaysian and one of my former students at Regent College. One of the things that we discovered was there's a perfect match for every one of the seven deadly sins 
and the fruit of the Spirit, which is a kind of a way of saying, right where you're hurting, right where you're struggling, right where you're having issues, right there, God is growing you, providing for you. And so my colleague, Dr. James Houston, brilliantly, I think, summarized the ninefold fruit of the Spirit, which is in Galatians chapter 5, with self-control, gentleness, and faithfulness as about ourselves. Just think of it. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not something we can just kind of work up on our own. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Patience, kindness, and goodness, hey, that's our relationships with others. And love, joy, and peace is our relationship with God. So, the uh, whole question, I always interview CEOs. Uh, when I get a chance, I say, what's the biggest issue you face? And they almost always say, work-life balance. And they know it's not a balance, it's a myth that you could ever get a balance. But it's work-life balance. And I think self-control. You know, Jesus did not live a balanced life. I heard one of the great preachers in the world preach a sermon on Jesus and the balanced life. He didn't live a balanced life. There were times he was so engaged he couldn't eat. And he would spend all night sometimes in prayer. Balance suggests that you've got everything in nice little compartments. Now we're moving to the next thing on the agenda. And there's just no sweat. I don't think Jesus lived a balanced life. He lived a disciplined life. And in Matthew it says, He dismissed the crowds to be alone with the Father. That's discipline. You know, I'd like to think that everybody got healed and helped and their dignity restored and they're now drifting off, going back to their villages and their homes. And Jesus says, oh, finally, I've got, I, finally I can go up in the mountain and pray and be with the Father in prayer. But it didn't happen that way. He said, please, go home. I can't help you today. I can't do it. I must be with the Father. So self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And gentleness. Meekness is not weakness. Wonderful book on this by Van Aken called The Gentle Life. Faithfulness. Your word is your bond. My father-in-law is the inventor of canola oil. Uh, it used to be rape oil, but they genetically modified it through breeding an Argentinian strand. And he was the person who headed that up. But he used to buy beans, uh, soya beans and other kinds of of things they could make oil from, like uh, ground nuts, peanuts, and so on, from China. He said, I love dealing with China because he said, we don't need a 40-page legal document and contract. He said, all we do is we say yes and shake hands. Your word is your bond. Faithfulness. And then uh, goodness, which is not treating people as junk and not treating the world as junk. You know, I, when I read this Genesis account, God sort of made the heavens and the earth, and he said, wow, it's good. I don't think it's just morally good. I think it's aesthetically good. It's beautiful. And then when he made you, he said, wow, beautiful. Think of it. That's goodness. And kindness is not softness. It's showing compassion, being positive, essentially positive towards people. And patience is one of the great virtues that we receive uh, in the context of the workplace. Peace, the threefold harmony of God, humankind, and creation. Joy is an infusion of God into our lives, a sense of equilibrium, even hard situations. Love is caring loyalty for people and places and structures. So, summarizing, recognize what's going on in your life, in your workplace. Take every challenge as an opportunity to grow. Prayer, confession, help. Pray your way through the day, before a meeting, 
when you hit the wall, when you're meeting a client, keep up your disciplines. Daniel was able to face a crisis because of his daily discipline and have an accountability group. That is a group of people that can name the lie on you, support you, pray for you. Thanks very much. Thank you.